I'm Lee Wilkins. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. And welcome to our panel on tough ethical decisions. Uh, um, I have a predilection against passive listening, which we did a lot of in the previous session. So I'm going to change the rules just a little bit. Uh, our panelists are going to to give you a scenario of an ethical decision that they've had to make either recently or something that stuck with them for a bit about something that they think is impertinent. They're going to take a couple of minutes to just give facts and then they're going to stop. They're not going to tell you what they did. They're not going to tell you what they think of, what they thought about doing. They're not going to tell you what their reader, viewer, listener, or tweeter response was. Instead, I am going to come out among you, stick the microphone in your face, and basically say, what do you think should be the decision here, or what do you think are important things to consider in thinking through this particular problem or problems like it? Everybody moderately with me? <laughs> there will not be a multiple choice test at the end of this session, OK? <laughs> yeah. Lock the doors. You can't leave. <laughs> Um, and I've talked with all the panelists a little bit beforehand. I'm going to allow you to go to the website to read their bios so that I can give the maximum amount of time for discussion. But I did tell Owen that I was going to ask him to start. So, Owen, you want to give us your ethical conundrum and we'll go from there. Uh, I'm a, an editor at USA Today and uh, one of the biggest problems we've had uh, in the past year because of the intense interest in the uh, political campaign is how we vet all the uh, claims of information that uh, the previous group did a very good job of explaining develops in the blogosphere, all kinds of websites, uh, a lot of it not verified, a lot of it opinion, a lot of it uh, rumors, a lot of it outright lies. And uh, under our uh, ethical guidelines, we need to try to make some sense of what we want to then disseminate to our readers uh, that we have concluded is credible. Uh, our basic values, and I think they were pretty well uh, summarized by the previous panel, include accuracy. Um, I wouldn't say, in my mind, truth-telling only because I've found truth is as kind of a lifetime quest, and I'm not sure I'll ever quite reach it, but certainly vac facts can be verified. <coughs> Fairness, which is to make sure you give all sides of an issue as best as possible and contact the people who may be criticized in a um, story you do. It's amazing when you reach them how often uh, you might change your opinion about what the story is. Thirdly, to provide uh, context, if there is any, which is basically, what does this mean to our readers? Uh, does it matter? Is it important to them? Um, does it affect their lives? Is there a larger meaning to it? And then fourth, which is most troubling for us, is transparency. What is the source of the information? Who is making the allegation? If it's something very critical, uh, we won't use unnamed sources. We feel that uh, people had to be responsible and be, uh, you know, stand up and say who they are if they're making a critical accusation. So against that backdrop, we uh, were um, besieged uh, during the campaign and after the election, uh, people on the left, people on the right, about why aren't you writing about and pursuing these stories that are so clearly true? So I'll give you three that we had to uh, deal with that we found troubling. Uh, in no particular order, but they at least give you an example of the range of uh, political complaints about our coverage. Uh, one was after the election, why didn't we expose the fact that Barack Obama was not born in the United States and therefore is ineligible to be president? How could we allow this constitutional travesty to occur uh, clearly, he, his uh, birth certificate in Hawaii was forged, and we know he was born, well, I'm not sure where he was born. And of course, this, this occurred when there was also a debate about John McCain being born in the Canal Zone and whether that really constituted uh, 
being a natural uh, a born citizen. So I guess it was possible we could have had two, two imposters as president. The second one is, this was from the left, how could we protect Sarah Palin and not tell the truth that her uh, baby Trig was really um, her daughter Bristol's baby and that she was just raising her granddaughter to protect the fact that Bristol had a baby out of wedlock. And the third was, why are you suppressing the information about John Edwards' affair? Uh, and uh, all three of them wait on us. And um, I think I'll, I'll save all the details for later to hear what your suggestions are and how we should handle all three stories. Okay, now, now the fun begins. Um, I will add, I told Owen that the night before I came here in my local Dead Tree newspaper, the Columbia Daily Tribune, there was a lengthy letter to the editor um, saying that Barack Obama was not born in America, that it was a uh, constitutional travesty, that he would be uh, president, and that he was a Muslim because his middle name is Hussein. Uh, so the notion that these things don't persist, um, I think that probably we can lay that one to rest. So I'm just going to go at random. So what would you be, do what would you be advising USA Today to do? I don't think any of those are really ethical questions or problems. I mean, you've got readers coming to you with lunatic theories and demanding that you treat them as serious. You just tell them that you don't do that. You don't write stories based on rumor and innu innuendo and speculation and lies. That, you know, there's no truth. There's no reason to believe these things. You know, the only way that a responsible newspaper would cover at least the first two of those stories is to say that there is this speculation that persists on the web and in certain segments of the population uh, that these things are, are out there, that uh, Sarah Palin's uh, uh, child is really her daughter and that uh, uh, Barack Obama is not a U.S. born citizen. And just set the record straight. Thank you. Well, I, don't, I think the, the first two are fairly, um, I would agree with, with Bill, they're, they're not terribly tough calls. There's rumors out there. The rumors are fairly widespread. To do fairly basic reporting, you can get at at least the knowable facts in those two situations. The third one, I think, is tougher with John Edwards' affair because, in fact, that wasn't a rumor. <laughs> um, and at what point do you take a rumor that affects someone's um, credibility um, and, and you go after it? And, you know, when he was a presidential candidate and that rumor was around, why does he get a free pass and not other people who those rumors are written against? I think that's the tougher one. Okay, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about rumors. What is the role? Nah, uh, no, 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 no quivering. <laughs> the role of what? Tell me. What's the role of either the mainstream media or the blogosphere in reporting on something like this, or is reporting even necessary? I think so. <laughs> um, well, I'm not a practicing journalist, so this is a little tough here. But um, as far as John Edwards, those kinds of stories I find annoying. I don't know how much of that we need to delve into. Um, I think, I mean, if he were my husband, I'd be upset. But <laughs> is this the kind of thing that we want to um, have take over a political campaign, for example? I, that, that kind of thing kind of bothers me as just a consumer of news. Okay. Uh, the other two stri always struck me as being so utterly absurd that you could pretty easily dismiss them and say, you know, there is no truth to any of this, and that's why we don't make it stories. Okay. All right, I'll take one more, and then we're going to go on to the next scenario. Yes, oh, a volunteer, I love it. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that hit me actually at the time was uh, with both political parties working hard to manipulate the media, why the Palin and Obama uh, situations that were outlined here were not used as a springboard into a story about how the political parties are trying to manipulate the media with, with uh, various rumors and innuendo, which would have helped uh, the electorate in, uh, in making their decisions, perhaps, and in looking at what was going on in a different way. Okay, so as we move on to the next scenario, I'll try to do a little bit of summarizing. The first one is, what is the role of the news media in reporting on rumors? To dispel them? To tell people they're not so? 
And what do we do when, despite our best reporting, people continue to believe a rumor? I think the second question was, which was raised back there is, what is the role of covering the private behavior of public people in a campaign for something like the presidency? Um, how do we cover that? Where's the, where are the lines? Um, over what? That sort of thing. I think one of the things that Owen raised, which I actually would like to get back at, is how is it that we do define transparency um, journalistically? Um, what does it mean to be transparent? And do we really want people to see how the sausage is made? Uh, and certainly, um, last but, but not least, is what's the deeper story here? And, and how is it that we get that? Is this the, the place where we, where we start to do stories on the, the spin room and you know, all of the other stuff that we now know goes on in the modern presidency? Okay, so those are all good things to think about. And eventually, we'll ask Owen what USA Today did. But for now, I'm going to ask Glenn, because he keeps telling me he's the odd person out here. He's not the guy with the big national platform. But I think that the issue he's going to raise is something that is, uh, affects big guys and little guys. So Glenn, you want to hit us? Yeah, I'm the one of these things is not like the other member of this uh, group here at this table. <laughs> um, these gentlemen deal with ethical issues on a national and regional basis every day. I'm someone who worked in small and medium markets uh, over the course of my career. We may not deal with the national issues on that level, but for a lot of the students watching today, a lot of the students here today uh, taking part in this, this is the element where you're going to be working, uh, especially when you start. Um, I guess the ethical dilemma I'm going to use that uh, a station I work at faced happened uh, just about two years ago. Um, our staff was told that uh, our television station management was working out a, a deal with a local health care facility wherein uh, that hospital would pay the station a sum of money and in return our new staff would have to produce two stories a week with one of our reporters. Uh, those stories would uh, be taken from a list supplied by that health care facility and uh, the only people we could talk to about those stories were employees of that health care facility. And um, obviously, uh, that raised some red flags. So I'll leave it up to you to decide uh, what that staff did. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Glenn, can I ask just a couple of other questions? I'm assuming from the way you're talking that this was not the only health care facility in the community. Is that right? That's correct. And I'm also assuming from the way you were talking that there was, in fact, going to be not just an exchange of, yes, we'll give you access, but there was an actual exchange of dollars as well? Yes. OK. I guess I, OK, here's a tough call. Um, you depend on your staff, you depend on your reporters to bring home the truth. What happens when you find a Jason Blair mid season? What do you do? OK, that's an internal tough call. That's an internal tough call, but what about, I mean, what about his decision here? Is this something that you just run away from screaming, or do you think there's, I mean, what are you working through? I think if money's been exchanged, I think that's a story. But probably for your competition. <laughs> <laughs> we're, a, we're a small group of uh, 11 weekly newspapers, and we, we occasionally have salespeople come to us asking, hey, this person wants to advertise, but they want an article done as well. We try to explain to them that the lines between advertising and editorial are pretty firm. Uh, but one idea we've talked about within our group with editors is if an advertiser wants to have PR pieces done on them, that we're not a PR firm, we're a newspaper, but uh, we may establish a blog for them on our website, which is exclusively their blog. They can write articles for it and post them. It's labeled as a blog, and, and it's a place for them to have those articles, but not necessarily appear in, in the newspaper. Okay. All right. I guess I keep picking on people. 
Well, in this particular situation in Eau Claire, uh, uh, assuming that you're the news director, you would say to yourself, hmm, how did this thing come about? And uh, I, I'm from a newspaper background, so I would walk into my publisher and say, um, let's talk about this. How did it come about? What's the reasoning? Um, I would determine whether uh, my, uh, my station manager or my publisher um, was somehow misguided in his conclusion and we can, we can retrofit this agreement somehow. Uh, in other words, get away from it. But um, uh, there have been times in my career as a newspaper editor where a, a publisher has started out in that area and I've said, uh, uh, if, if we do this, then I have to resign. Okay, I want to put a little pressure on this. I'm assuming that I'm not the only person who came to this conference this morning having watched a little TV or heard a little NPR or read something in the newspaper about the, the um, what are we supposed to call it now, the A1N1 virus? N1N1. And H1, thank you, thank you. Uh, and, and where that all is. One of the things that at least we think we know at the University of Missouri is that audiences, regardless of medium, are very, very interested in healthcare news. It comes up on the top of almost all of the surveys, at least that I've seen in the last five years. Here you've got an outfit that is offering you the kind of access that many journalists would kill to get, to actually be able to talk to a physician, to actually be able to talk to a surgeon about something that's going on. Um, at least in my community where there are multiple hospitals under multiple organizations, getting that access is practically impossible. So I want to ask you folks as you're thinking about this, is this really of so little news value that you feel that you can walk away from it? And now we have an answer from the blogosphere. <laughs> I'm sorry, Wendy. Can I just add in um, that the discussion there has now turned to not that the stories would necessarily not be newsworthy, but that in accepting money, um, it feels like contract PR, and it would be uncomfortable writing these stories or covering these stories because I would feel obligated to put them in a good light, put that business in a good light. Okay. Anything else? Whoops. All kinds of hands. Science writers. Uh, first of all, I think your uh, premise that uh, it's hard to get to talk for, for reporters to, I think your premise that it's hard for reporters to get to talk to docs is erroneous. Hospitals have well-oiled PR machines that love, absolutely love to get their docs uh, ink, airtime, whatever. So if hospital A doesn't want to do it, hospital B, Hospital C, University uh, D, is in the queue. Secondly, in terms of this, uh, the, the instant case, as the lawyers say, doing, you know, accepting this, just in terms of a practical thing, would open the um, uh, newsroom to being uh, tarred and feathered by a newspaper or a competition because someone's going to find that out. And you don't want you know, the embarrassment, the humiliation of seeing that reported is just, you know, extraordinary. So, and I am surprised at how short-sighted the folks are that propose this idea. Okay. Charlotte? Oops. Just quickly, the comment that you made about the fact that people will be watching this and the importance of the health dimensions, I think that's a great example of why it really does have to be ethical. Basically, um, I, I understand both sides of the argument, and it would be great to, you know, have access to the uh, healthcare facility. But then again, the fact that there's money exchanged, it, it just doesn't seem right. It's like as if the facility is going to have control of not just the newspapers, but he mentioned the lists that you're going to have to choose from. So it just doesn't. It's not something that I would be interested in doing. So. All right. I have to ask Mr. Black to come to Columbia, Missouri and try to cover our VA. 
Aha! <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So, um, yeah, yeah. so one of the things that's come up here that was a word that I was listening for in the previous panel and didn't hear, but I think everybody sort of circled around it, is what happens to journalistic independence when money changes hands or agreements like this get made? And I think on the other side, which is something that did also come up this morning, is how is it that we get this sort of journalism done if our advertisers or our sponsors are unwilling to pay for it. And here's a chance where somebody is stepping up and being willing to pay. And then what's the distinction between this local healthcare outfit and the Pulitzer Center um, on an ethical plane? How are, we, how are we to distinguish between and among organizations like this? So y'all can think about that. All right. Um, Want to go next? Sure. Thank you. Go for it. <laughs> um, before I kind of jump in quickly to my example, um, I'll give a little overture, a little background. I, what I think is really important about this conference is understanding um, the more the public and the more we're transparent and talk about some of the ethical and tough decisions that are made in newsrooms. And one of the things that really struck me as I moved um, through my career to different positions, that all of a sudden when I got to be editor of the newspaper, in my hands, all of a sudden, is the credibility of the organization and how we look um, to the community. And in lower positions, you could always sort of look back, look up. There was somebody above you, the managing editor, the editor, someone else. And all of a sudden, um, the tough decisions are, are coming into your, your hands. And often, um, at least in, during the time early on in my career, there was not much training in this, not much discussion. Either they were made behind closed doors and they weren't made um, out in the newsroom. And um, as, as you sort of get into this sometimes, um, and I've struggled with these for many, many years in, in some real tough calls about what do we do, how do we do it, and sometimes under excruciating deadlines, and now it's even faster with um, the web, um, I think a little bit about a, um, a newspaper story that it goes back years and years ago to uh, it ran in the New York Daily News, and a man had got arrested for um, stealing 143 television sets. And he had a little apartment in New York, and his apartment is filled with 143 television sets. And he's standing in front of the judge, and the judge says, you know, how could you do this? Well, what's going on here? And the um, guy who had stolen the television set sort of looked up at him and said, sir, there are no easy answers. This is not a simple life. <laughs> and, <laughs> just made an unbelievable story. Um, and I think of that sometimes when we go through the struggles. My um, example, though, is, is really pretty simple. Um, when, um, a couple years ago, we had a picture um, that had been a fire in Milwaukee. And in the, in the um, uh, fire, a child was killed, and the mother was not home. And we had a picture of the mother arriving at home and at the moment that she was told that her child had died in the fire, um, we had a picture, um, an incredibly dramatic photo, of uh, the woman at the moment that she's being told that, um, I think it was her son, had died in the fire. And the proposal in the newsroom was, what a dramatic picture. This is news. Um, we're going to put it across the top of um, page 1A. So you know, there's your decision, um, what are you going to do? And I throw out into it, does it make any difference if you have it on uh, a photograph like that that you're going to use on the web, if you, you have it as video that you're going to use on the web, or if you have it video for your okay. Um, television station? Okay. So, Sheila, I'm not going to pick on you because well, you... Okay, go. <laughs> um, this. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Um, this um, reminds me of a, a terrible time when a California newspaper, and many of you might rem remember that, a dramatic uh, uh, photojournalistic paper was of the little boy at the time he sees his dead brother who drowned. And the look on his face was so dramatic, and they, they published it because of the drama. They, they rationalized it that maybe um, it would help other people realize that this was a dangerous place to swim. And the public 
was so outraged, and it continued on and on, that the story became, we wish we had not printed that paper because it's an invasion of privacy when your loved one has died. That's the Riverside paper, right? If I'm remembering yes. my yeah. cases correctly. Okay. Hi, um, I'm reminded of the Oklahoma City bombing picture with the, the poor little baby in the firefighter's arm, and arms, which I've never fully looked at because it's so disturbing. And it does, I agree with Sheila, it does seem like such an invasion of privacy with the Oklahoma City bombing, you could say this is a story of great significance. And, and I think the argument was that this really, you know, embodied it. Yeah. So one question I would have about the mother in the fire is, was the story of enough significance that capturing the mother at the moment of finding out her child died, was that the way to embody it? Okay. Great yes. question. Yeah, I would agree with uh, what you both said so far. Uh, what is the truth value in showing that picture? Uh, you have to use, uh, I'm not a journalist, so I'm using these terms loosely, uh, editorial discretion. Uh, if indeed the picture is necessary, uh, or we could use a term similar to that, uh, to convey the truth of what's happening, then I then go ahead and do it. But I would be very careful about invading someone's privacy. Why do you have to do it? Is it going to really change the truth aspect of what you're doing? Philip, you were in Oklahoma City, so I'm going to pick on someone I know using knowledge that not everyone in this room has. The, the drowning photo came from uh, the Bakersfield newspaper. Uh, another photo from Riverside was of the mother who was drenched in her child's blood, having backed over her own child after dropping that child off at daycare. And, of course, I covered the Oklahoma City bombing. I think one of the issues I like to cover with my students is, okay, if you're going to justify a fire photo, a drowning photo, or something like that over the fact that the public needs to know this is a dangerous place to swim, why am I seeing that in the Oklahoma paper when I'm not very likely to be swimming in Bakersfield? Is it a universal uh, problem? Um, or am I just a voyeur uh, looking in on this? Anybody here work with photojournalists during their careers other than the editors in the room? Okay. Because one of the things that I've been really lucky to work with some very talented photojournalists, um, among them Brian Lanker and Charlie Nye, two names people may know. And one of the things I can hear being said in the newsrooms that I've worked in is, this is a very good photograph. Look at the information that is contained in this photograph. There are things in this photograph that it's extraordinarily difficult to capture in words. How can you not think about including this photograph in the news coverage? Go. I was a television person, and so you have video, and which can be extraordinarily uh, emotional. And uh, I, I was fortunate for most of my career to work at a very ethical station, and we decided really on a case-by-case -case basis and usually erred in the side of protecting someone's privacy. Um, but we had real situations. We, we used to have terribly deadly flash floods and we had a photojournalist who knew he was about to win an award as he was watching two little children get swept away in the flash flood and he's got his camera on his shoulder. And he was also a father. And he put down his camera and he jumped in the water and he saved the children and didn't win his award. And this is the kind of thing that we just do uh, because we do, it, it, sometimes in a split second, have very good ethical decisions. Okay, I knew this one. Here in the, here, okay. Scott Angus from Janesville. I, I'll take a bit of a contrary view in that I, w I did a discussion with high school kids yesterday. We had a very controversial photo last week that was the topic of discussion, which is another item. Uh, but among the things I showed was a very similar photo, a woman uh, just learning that her son had drowned at our local pool. It was a tremendously compelling photo. I think the idea this is an a, intrusion on a private moment, or excuse me, a, a intrusion of privacy is a little bit misguided. Much of these things happen in front of hundreds of people. Um, it may be an intrusion on a private moment, but you're not really invading people's privacy in the same sense. You're not in people's homes. The other thing I think is important to think about is that you know, we're, we show photos of people celebrating and, and having happy moments, and, and we're, we're more than happy to do that. 
on the flip side, you know, we were hesitant to show people on, on the other side of the emotions. And I think it's important in some cases, not every case, to look at those and make a decision that, you know, when, when somebody dies in your community, it's a loss. And, and it's very easy for people to read uh, words on a paper and, and not really comprehend that. What we're charged to do is, is to convey to people uh, all sorts of things. And, and among them, I think we should convey is, is a sense of loss. And, and I think we can do that with photos that we can't do another way. So I think that's an argument to look at it very seriously and not necessarily say no because it's going to offend people. We offend people all the time. Yeah, and, and, and to go along with that, at least most of the broadcast news organizations that I work with have a body bag policy. I'm assuming a lot of newspapers do too. We don't show people in body bags. We don't take that shot anymore. We don't do the perp walk. Um, there are ethical reasons for those things, but they certainly go to some of the things you've been talking about. I understand the blogosphere has weighed in. Yeah. Well, you're having actually a really, uh, whoops, sorry. Um, to, uh, to echo just what was just said is that privacy and consent aren't the only issues here, but we need to be balancing and thinking about um, the other side of the equation, which is public interest. What can we do to raise awareness about safety and impact on a community and community building? What does it mean that this has happened in our community? But the fascinating debate that's going on right now is that um, some commenters are posting links to the photos you're all questioning, and that has led to an ethical question about the posting of those within <laughs> our cover at Live. And I'm going to give you In, in Newsweek this week, there's a three-page story about a California couple who is trying to get the photographs of their, of their dead daughter off of the Internet after they were released by the Highway Patrol. And one of the second or third paragraphs in the story was about the fact that they feared that by going public in Newsweek, everybody would Google their daughter's name. Okay, I'm going to give one more person, then we're going to get to the last question, and I'm getting my exercise. No, my comment was simply was that I think newspaper or, or journalists don't often go beyond the headlines. I get very tired of what I consider headline news. And in the Oklahoma City bombing, for example, why not a series of articles on what creates hate groups and the fact that there are hate groups and they're growing? Nobody ever talks about that aspect of the story. Okay. Y'all woken up yet? Yeah, oh, yeah. Sure. I'm sorry, I just want to add one more thing. Um, the firefighter, it was Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, gently carrying the little girl that was dead. Um, her name was Bailey. And if you followed the story, um, uh, the firefighter eventually met the mother. And the mother, the grief was done. This little girl was gone. But she, wanted, she uh, um, uh, felt um, grateful that... Um, uh, the last moments of her life, or just after she had died, she had been treated so carefully. So it's, it, there's one thing, there's a difference between the initial grief and horror that someone finds out that their child has died versus the fact that there's nothing more you can do and it's a firefighter and that I think is a new story. Okay. We're going to end with politics. Do I know what we did? Not yet. Oh. <laughs> so Scott? Sorry. Um, yeah, so my, uh, as a senior political producer for CNN.com at the time, um, and my example comes from the, the very heated Democratic primary of 2008. Um, this, uh, we had learned that uh, John Edwards had scheduled a press conference. We, I think we learned that about 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, it was supposed to occur about, I want to say like 11 o'clock, so we had about a two-hour lead. We did not know what the news conference was about. We knew that his wife, Elizabeth Edwards, who had suffered from cancer, breast cancer, but had recovered, was going to join him. That's all we knew. About, so about 9.30, uh, Politico, um, one of the bloggers, Ben Smith, had blogged that John Edwards was dropping out of the race, which was not inconceivable at the time. He was trailing both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Um, he wasn't doing as well in the financing as we had thought. Um, this, of course, was before um, all the fair stuff had, had come out. So this is 9.30, and the press conference, I, it might have been like 10 o'clock. We really had like a half-hour window um, before the press conference. We had to make a decision. Do we report what that Politico had done on their blogs and launch that on the entire CNN network? Now, considering when, you, when CNN makes a decision, it's just not CNN online. It's not CNN broadcast. 
it's CNN Twitter feeds, it's, it's CNN blogging, uh, the Politico blog, it's CNN radio, it's all the news alerts that go on text messages. This is not a um, small decision to make. You can't retract it. It goes out, and it goes out to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Put this in context, um, Politico is a partner with MSNBC. MSNBC is fonting their, this report, uh, John Edwards to drop out of the race, according to Politico. We had a decision to make. And they should have done. Well, it sounds to me like you just have to protect your own uh, reputation in that, in that case, and you could run with it, but you should at least attribute to you know, all the aspects of it that you just described, <laughs> just to cover yourself. I think that um, probably to uh, check with, to say that, uh, to describe it to uh, the, the source, as you mentioned, would probably be the way I would handle it. Brant? How would I handle what? <laughs> has lots of experience in this sort of stuff, so what should they do? I think you would figure out what you could do to run the story. You'd, I think you'd make a judgment, discuss it, and do everything you could to run. Other folks? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think you make a very quick, at least cursory call to your very best source in that campaign and see if even on background they'll tell you if you're going to be burned if you broadcast this and you attribute it to, this, to Politico um, and just see if your source will give you any indication whether you're in trouble. That would help. I think I'd tell my staff, we're getting beat on a story and you better go get it and I wouldn't use it. Yeah, similar. I mean, CNN does have some reporters, I believe. Um, and it's not like the world's going to end take cover if we don't put this story on the web right now. It'll actually be out there in half an hour. Okay. I want to come, I gotcha. I want to come back to this in a minute because this is something that sort of came up in a veiled way in the first panel. The notion is that if we don't have it in the next half hour, what's the fallout? And I think this is a place, this is me speaking now, um, where... Half hour, I'm sorry, half hour is a long time. We had five minutes. He just said what I was going to say. <laughs> in the blogosphere. Okay, somebody had a hand up. Wave it. Yes, ma'am. I think what's really important when you're using Twitter or blogs or unconfirmed sources is to use those as the first step in reporting and not the last step. So if you do see something on Politico, maybe then make that cursory call or do whatever you can to confirm it. But because we are the sense makers, to really do whatever we can to confirm that and not just quote, says Politico, but says somebody from the campaign. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Well, the fellow who introduced me to copy editing in this school, Scott Cutlip, uh, uh, told, many of you recognize that name, uh, uh, made a point of talking about the, uh, the news media's, uh, uh, not only newspapers but broadcasts, our fetish for speed and how it has damaged our credibility uh, with, uh, with our readers. And it's much better to get it accurate and get it right and, and give up a little bit on the fetish for speed. Okay, Sharon. What if competition is uh, uh, an important characteristic of the relationships between media organizations and has very little to do with the relationship between a media organization and the audience? Uh, I think competition here is an internal issue and not much of a public one. Okay, doke. All right. Oh, Cliff? Maybe an additional uh, observation uh, based on Sharon's. Social responsibility theory says it's the facts, but in the context of meaning, 
And ultimately, the way CNN handles this is finally the determinant to uh, the public. That is, do they explain it correctly? Do they give the background? Do they help us try and interpret this, come to grips with the issue? And whether they beat the competition or not is a short-term kind of thinking that that doesn't help to create this integrity of social responsibility. I will also add that when I was a journalist, which was a while ago, we hated to say, as reported in the Rocky Mountain News or as in the Denver Post, we have a distinct bias, in my view, towards information that we uncover no matter how trivial. Okay. Um, thank you all very much for participating in this part of the experiment. Now I have to establish the rules. The rules are no yelling and no throwing food, regardless of what the decision was made. We ate all the donuts, so I think there will be flu fewer objects. Stephen, no throwing that. So now I'm going to start in the order that we started and get our panelists to describe what they did and some of the thought processes that went into that, and then go back out and ask you folks essentially to comment on that. Okay, Owen? Okay. In all these cases, just to provide some context, because I think you all made some very uh, valuable observations uh, that we did debate. One of them, uh, one point was made, well, these are just rumors. But uh, I found in my career that's what often starts out as a, a rumor could lead to uh, an amazing story because a lot of these rumors turn out to be true. Uh, I believe uh, the Washington Post's uh, Pulitzer Prize winning series over a year ago on uh, terrible conditions at Walter Reed Hospital began with a tip over the transom that someone had just called, said you should look into this. So you just never know when you're going to come across an amazing story, um, uh, even though it might sound kind of incredible at, you know, at the beginning. Think about kind of how the Watergate uh, scandal unfolded as, as a burglary. So I think it's really important never to keep your mind closed and assume it's not important and you shouldn't pursue it. Uh, the second thing is one of the reasons I think the so-called uh, MSM that we represent uh, have less and less uh, respect and credibility with a lot of people in the public is that it's as if we are in on secrets and we don't share them and we don't report on them. And I think that's, that's a real problem. And I think we do have to look again at stories that are important to our readers and, and decide whether we should pursue them. So I do think even extramarital affairs go to the heart of character. And certainly character is a very important uh, criterion when we vote for a president or even consider someone for a vice president. So I think the allegations, like in the case of Edwards, uh, might be within bounds to pursue. But let's take the first one, whether Obama was really uh, born in the USA or not. Uh, again, as the example I mentioned before, it resonated with me that um, there could be fraudulent documents, as in the case of the National Guard uh, documents that were presented about George Bush. So what I did was I went to our White House team and I said, is there any way we can look into this and verify uh, that Obama had a valid birth certificate in Hawaii because those who said he wasn't were claiming to have evidence and an unnamed source who was saying that a document was forged. And I felt that we shouldn't ignore it. We should at least do the best we can to, to see if we could find out what, what the truth was. Well, it turned out there was a group that went to Hawaii. It wasn't us, but uh, another organization in Hawaii interviewed uh, the Secretary of State and got a copy of the record and sent via the web a PDF file that had a close-up view of the birth certificate even with cross sections close up so you could see that the seal was actually raised as it's supposed to be, which provided pretty good evidence that it was not a forged document. And uh, we had on the record uh, the Secretary of State saying he was born in Hawaii and there is absolutely nothing to suggest that it was forged. We reported that and we considered it uh, the end of the story. I guess there are still conspiracy theorists who think that this was all made up, but at least we did address the issue uh, later, if not sooner. 
In the case of uh, Sarah Palin, this was kind of kind of a tricky one. It was really out there. There were these allegations. Um, uh, we initially ignored them because there was absolutely no credible evidence to suggest that uh, Sarah Palin was not pregnant and didn't carry a, a baby to term during the period. And as it turned out, someone had actually asked her, and she, you may recall, addressed this and, and actually provided evidence because she was upset about the allegations and talked about uh, what it was like uh, having the child late uh, in term while she was a public official. So that story kind of did come out and was settled, and I haven't heard anything recently that that was um, a, a false claim by her. Finally, on John if Edwards. Just, one phone. thing on, on the Sarah Palin story. Uh, I was in St. Paul for the Republican Convention last year. If you remember, Monday was canceled because of the hurricane. So you had literally th a thousand journalists with nothing to do. <laughs> and we were literally looking at photos of the Sarah of the Palin family and passing photos around going, Bristol look pregnant to you? Yeah, Bristol kind of looks pregnant to me. She is, you know, she is kind of showing and there's a ring there, you know, and literally we were looking at digital photos, talking around tables, and I think of that if they had not come out that Bristol pregnant, uh, Palin was pregnant the next day, that was like Tuesday night, some news organization would have gone with that rumor because you looked at those photos and Bristol looked pregnant. She really did. And I was convinced, you know, I was like, it's so crazy, but you look at those photos and something wasn't right. And so you'd be surprised how close that story was going to go. Either it would have been some blog, like Huffington Post, that went with the rumor and it probably would have caused a storm. And I, I'm sure, absolutely certain, that's why they came out with Bristol Palin being pregnant on Tuesday night. And by Thursday night, the whole family was there, and they're in the box. It was very weird because then Sydney McCain was kind of playing like grandmother to this, to the child. The, uh, it, it was kind of a weird tableau, but and they were like all of a sudden, oh yes, we're a big happy family, and Levi is invited, and he's all clean cut in his suit and tie, and, and on the on the convention floor as part of the family. But on Monday with nothing to do, you had thousands, you know, literally a thousand journalists looking at digital photos of, of Bristol Palin. And I, for one, was pretty sure she looked pregnant and it turned out she was pregnant. So it, it was close. Right. Oh, and you want to finish up the, did you finish up the Sorry, no, on, on John Edwards, I was going to say that this was kind of the trickiest one because you may recall he was not a presidential candidate at the time, so he's more a private citizen. On the other hand, he had been mentioned as possible vice presidential candidate, so he wasn't completely out of the, the public picture. Plus, he had, as we talked about, had dragged his wife into his story as kind of being a family man and standing by his woman. We just didn't know what woman, I guess, as it turns <laughs> out. Um, we, we have a policy, and I'll sort of disagree with you a little bit, Lee, on, on what we do. One thing that we like to do, which goes to both surveillance and transparency, is we think there's a story out there that we can't confirm, but it's being, uh, at least the source is what we consider a credible uh, medium, whether it's uh, CNN or a local newspaper in New York Times, will say they are reporting X. We try to say, you know, what the source of their information is, if their name sources or not, and then add USA Today could not verify the information independently. We've been transparent. We provided the readers the information, told them what we know, told them what we didn't know. In the case of Edwards, the source was the National Enquirer. And this, you know, frankly, we didn't consider the National Enquirer to be a credible uh, news organization. But hey, guess what? They were right. So, you know, there's another a lesson to be learned. But, you know, we wouldn't consider them being the only one peddling the story as someone that we would pick up. So we ignored it. I told uh, our reporters that if Anyone else gets hold of Edwards, asks them about it, you know, we'd consider doing a story. We ran a short item when I think it was the Charlotte Observer. I asked him and he denied that there was any truth to it and we ran that story. Um, so there's another question of whether we are serving our readers. And then, of course, he went public, I guess, was it on 60 Minutes? I can't remember who he confessed it all and he said it was true. So. There's another good lesson for us to learn, and of course we ran that story. Oh, and I have, I have one follow-up question. Um, 
there are lots of rumors that circulate with even city council campaigns, let alone presidential campaigns. And like everybody else, you have a limited staff. So is part of the decision-making process the fact that we just simply don't have any bodies to throw at this right now? Our, our reporters are out covering other stuff. I mean, how much of that sort of the limited resource issue comes, comes into what right. you decide to follow and what you don't? Actually, in all three of these cases, we decided we did not have the resources that we considered them priorities to send someone out and vetted. Instead, we relied on um, whether it was the Associated Press or other news organizations. If they had vetted them, we decided we would run their stories, but we would not invest our own scarce resources. Okay. Greg, you want to fill us in? I mean, excuse me, Glenn, you want to fill us in which dip? Well, I, I chose this question, in, I guess, in part because, A, it uh, did present a bit of a personal <coughs> question for me to have to answer. But more importantly, I think the, what happened speaks in part to a couple of comments that were uh, mentioned in the previous panel. Um, there was debate for, I would guess, probably four to six weeks over this. Obviously, our, our news department mentioned the red flag. Uh, are we selling news content? If we decide that we're going to make this arrangement with a hospital, and two times a week produce a story that they basically spoon feed us, only talking to their representatives. What's to say that six months down the road, uh, a local hardware supplier approaches our advertising staff and says, hey, I'll give you X amount of dollars if you do a home improvement segment once a week on your 5 o'clock news, but you can only talk to our people. Pretty soon you're not a newscast anymore. Pretty soon you're nothing more than really a, a, a paid infomercial. And, and our staff realized that. And after about five or six weeks, um, I was brought into the office and told that uh, this deal's 99% done. You have to sell it. You have to go and tell your news staff that you're doing it. And uh, was told, quite frankly, uh, I believe the quote was, wipe the capital J off your sweater because that's not the way it is anymore. And um, the staff knew that this was occurring, and uh, they had stood up against it. They were fighting it. Uh, so I was faced with the question of uh, being insubordinate to my superior and not doing it, and... I'm sure I've probably walked up to the line quite a few times, but I don't think I've ever been insubordinate to my superior in this industry. Or I could uh, walk into the newsroom and tell our staff that we were going to cut this deal with an area hospital and that it was a good thing. And uh, my conscience wouldn't allow me to do that, so, uh, and I didn't want to be insubordinate, so I resigned. Now. That's not the here nor there of it. The most important part of it is what happened with that staff. And this is where it leads to something that Ellen had mentioned in the previous panel when she said, we need to be good coaches to young journalists coming up. And the most amazing thing to me that I saw during this whole episode, debacle, whatever you want to call it, was people who had been in that news department and been journalists for 20 years stood up against this, and they fought it, and they said this is wrong. And people who had been professional journalists for seven, eight, nine, maybe ten months stood up against this and said this is wrong. And, and um, it also kind of leads to the web question that we had earlier, and, and I'm probably phrasing this wrong, but the person who asked, uh, what can be done to keep me as a young journalist believing in ethical journalism? The fact that that person asked that question, she, they just answered it. Um, and so our staff continued to fight that, and eventually it, uh, it didn't happen. Because there were probably seven to ten people in that newsroom who said, if you do this, I'm not going to work here anymore. I will walk, because it is wrong. And that by people who were multi-year veterans of, of the news business and by people who were just getting started in the news business to put their careers on the line like that shows that the people in this room and the people watching 
the, the editors and the news directors and the uh, people who are teaching in college are doing a good job of instilling that ethical foundation onto this new generation that's coming in. And speaking to the previous panel, again, you're right, ethics do not change. Whether we are publishing it in a newspaper, broadcasting it on a TV station, or putting it onto someone's cell phone, or having someone draw it up on an internet page, the ethics stay the same. The method of delivery changes and the technology changes, but the ethics stay the same. And this was a great example of a group of young and sometimes not so young people who knew that and did the right thing because of what they were taught. Okay. Um, if we have time, I'd like to come back and put just a little bit of pressure on what you just said, because at least in my local television market, that's number 141, okay, really huge. Um, we do a lot of medical VNRs. Uh, we run a lot of them. All three stations do. And so while this is a great example of an approach, I think if I spent even another 24 hours in Madison, Wisconsin, I would discover that your local television outlet is running VNRs without labeling them as such. So I want to come back to this whole notion of the struggle, especially in local broadcasting, to get enough content to actually be able to air news, you know, at, well, ours starts now at 4.30 in the morning and has, you know, several newscasts all through about 10 o'clock at night. But, you know, this is one example, but the, the, I think the more widespread one, at least that I see evidence of, is unlabeled VNRs on local TV news. And what do we do, if anything, about that? Marty, you want to tell us what you guys did? Um, yeah, you could probably tell from my discussion before that I was very concerned about uh, the photo and um, got a discussion going in the middle of the newsroom and one of the leaders of the discussion was very strong that there's, this is news, we've got to put it out there, this is a tremendous photograph, it belongs to the top of the front page, um, we've got to go with this, it's just no question, this is news. Um, and I let a lot of people have a say in what they thought about it and as I went around the, the group, which was mostly photographers and designers, there was a big campaign to run this photo one of the things, though, th that I noticed as I was um, listening to some of the people, there was hardly anyone in that group who had kids. And it goes to how important diversity is in a, in a newsroom. And so then I involved some more um, editors and uh, designers, photographers, whatever, into the discussion. And it was interesting how the discussion changed when um, people had um, kids. And one of the questions that I, I really threw out to them was, um, okay, if this is okay, um, is there a line? Is there any line where we just don't run a picture? What, what's the line that's out there? Because underneath my feelings was, um, I, think, I couldn't think of anything more horrific than the loss of your child and to have your picture taken at that moment. Um, and um, so I was, sort of fairly strongly against this. Another factor that was going on was interesting was the photographer took it as one of our most aggressive photographers. In the back of my mind, I, f uh, I felt that he was probably in favor of it and that we had talked to him. Um, so eventually the decision that we made was um, not to use the photo on the front page. We put it much smaller inside the newspaper um, and we used it in, in black and white. Um, an interesting thing happened Later, um, I thought the mistake I made is I never asked what the photographer thought, and usually I prided myself over the years in, in getting the photographers involved, but he had gone home. And uh, later that evening on the way out, the um, photo director stopped into my office and said, you know, I called um, Jeff about the photo, and he's really glad we're not using the photo which just sort of um, stunned me because his reputation was really push hard, get good photos. And we do have some pretty strong rules on um, when we're at funerals and things like that, that, that we ask the family for permission to be there and then try to be very transparent with the reader when we're using a controversial photo and say in the cut lines that um, the, it was okay with the um, uh, family that we took the photo. 
What was interesting, the next day, it was a first Saturday paper, we probably, I think we had 24 phone calls, uh, something like that, of people complaining about the photo, even though it was black and white and used inside. Um, and just coming back personally, I even go so far as to say I wish we hadn't even used it black and white inside. Um, I go back to what I started in the beginning, talking about an editor making a decision, and I sort of felt that I'd won the battle to get it off the front page and I had um, got it inside smaller, black and white. Um, and the other reason for putting it inside, by then someone had read the story. They understood the context of it before they got to the photograph. And I think that's a, a, an argument maybe for using it inside and one of the arguments for not out front because you wouldn't understand the context and the uh, just huge across the top of the page. But it may be completely different online and, and in, in a video. Um, uh, or on television where it's flashing quickly and it's over. Of course, now with YouTube, you could see it over and over again. Okay, that, that's a great segue to, to one of the questions I wanted to ask Marty about. How long would you say the newsroom wrestled with this? We talk in minutes or hours? Uh, it wasn't hours. It was a pretty quick um, decision. Okay. And then, Scott, I want to take sort Can of I where ask Marty. A about oh, the, yeah, go sure. ahead. What about the online treatment? Because since there isn't really an you know, inside page online the same way, it's um, in I don't too. think we used it online. I'm almost yeah. sure we didn't use it online. Okay. Scott, I want to sort of leapfrog to you because you were the person who brought this up about, you know, if it's, if it's Twitter, it's practically instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, how much do you think time matters here or do you think good quality decisions are getting made even in this environment? Um, I think it's more, it's more gut, you know, which, and you can talk about training is you, you make gut decisions now that are within me. Just to tell the outcome of the story, um, we did go with the report attributing to Politico. Uh, we had Network, which is Atlanta, on the phone screaming, do you have it yet? Do you have it yet? Our political director was like, let me talk to my reporters. You have five minutes. They didn't have it back. Political, you know, the political director like, look, it's coming out in 20 minutes. We can wait. Network said, no, we got to go with it. They went with that report attributing to Politico, and once you know, once the decision made, it's going on network. It's going everywhere. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Big explosion! So it's going, it's going online, going on Twitter. Of course, now 20 minutes later, the Edwards come out. Uh, John uh, Elizabeth Edwards announced that cancer has come back. She now has breast cancer again. It's moved to her ribs. John Edwards then announces that he's not dropping out of the race and staying on because Elizabeth Edwards wants him to continue the fight. Great, you know. So we got it wrong, completely wrong. Everyone got it wrong. Um, and literally, if we would have waited 20 minutes, we would have got it right. Now, let me put this in context. Polit CNN's brand is CNN equals politics. MSN, MSNBC's brand is the best, the best place for politics. We are the best political team. Fox News is something like, you know, your place for politics. Everyone wanted to own political news, and if you're first, you reinforce that brand. So it's vitally important that, you know, yes, there's competition, and yes, you might have got it wrong, but you can't let the competition take that brand of you're the place for politics. And that's what they're trying to reinforce. So it's a tough decision. I mean, it, you know, that's the pressure you're under. Um, the second thing is like this is a this is a very compelling story. Elizabeth Adler is a very sympathetic person, and so the traffic on this is going to be much greater and online. And I think one of the big differences, you know, I, I'm you know I, I can't say I have a long distinguished career like many other people in this room. I of course started as a newspaper reporter for the Wisconsin State Journal as a night reporter. You know, I would go out, cover a car accident, write the story. If it's a big story, I may have gotten the front page. And I would assume as a young little, little reporter, okay, everyone read my story, right? Every, what, circulation of the Wisconsin State Journal was, like 200,000 or whatever. I assume everyone read that. Yeah, what day was it? <laughs> yeah, right. So, Tuesday, so it's a Tuesday. So I, I assume everyone read my story on the front page of Wisconsin State Journal. Now, though, which, but in reality, though, people might get the paper, check the front section, might read about the Brewers or the Badgers or might write, read the home garden section, it may never even get to the front page. But as journalists, we didn't know that, right? We assumed it's a front page story, right? We spent six months on this report. It's on the front page. I was going to read it, right? 
and they may not re read it. Online, of course, now, the metrics, we know instantaneously, second by second, what headlines people are clicking on. We know the Elizabeth uh, uh, Edwards story is being clicked on, and there might be a million page views that day. The investigative you know, story about Social Security might get maybe 100,000 page views. Okay, so we know what people are clicking on. We know what our readership or viewership wants. And that creates a very interesting dilemma because at one point we're supposed to be telling the truth, but we're also supposed to be delivering a product that people read. And if t people are clicking on things and say, look, we want the Elizabeth Edwards story or you know, the Anna Nicole Smith story. Um, I told Stephen Ward the story the day that Anna Nicole Smith died. Um, it was in the afternoon. Usually, CNN used to get about three million page views on its homepage about four o'clock. That day, the hour that she died, our page views on the homepage went up to 12 million. It quadrupled by four, which is usually our noontime peak. And I just remember all that day, I was, you know, in Washington going to cocktail parties, like, oh, this is horrible, this, this cover, you know, wall to wall cover to Anna Nicole Smith. Yes, it's horrible. Yes, it's horrible. And then I say, well, you know, but she's a very sympathetic character and she talks about how, you know, the role of women in society today and I'm trying to do all these justifications. And then finally I was like, look, that's how we make money now. You know, you want to bag that bureau? You want to have CNN with all the satellite technology during Hurricane Katrina and take all the same technology to develop for the war and pop, pop it down in the middle of, of New Orleans and tell the government, look, yes, people are dying. It's flooding. You can't deny this. We have the camera there. We have the satellite technology to get that image out. You pay for that with your stories about um, Anna Nicole Smith or Elizabeth Edwards. And of course, you know, people, oh, that's horrible. How, you know, you can't, you know, that's, that's you know, violating your ethics as journalists. You know, you have social responsibility, which we all do. But on the flip side, you got to pay the bills. You got to, you know, if you're going to spend a million dollars on satellite technology, uh, you know, I've worked for PBS. I've worked for, the, you know, PBS NewsHour. Uh, PBS NewsHour does not have satellite trucks that can roll within 30 minutes, and they shouldn't. Um, that's not their mission. So, you know, it, it, is, it is tough, and I think right now, because we have so much better metrics, we know what people are reading on, and we you have to make these, and these decisions must be made much faster, and we can't, you kind of like go, oh, well, that's, this is good journalism, we're going to do that, and then ignore the fact that our bills are really being paid and probably have always been paid by the sports sections, the real estate sections, the home and garden sections, the style, you know, the lifestyle sections that were always the, oh, that's the, the fluff, right, we put that in, but and that doesn't win Pulitzers, but really that's the stuff that often paid for the six-month investigative piece. Um, and uh, you know, but now we know. Now we can look at the reports and hit reports, and I'm sure the Journal Sentinel gets traffic reports every day and goes, well, that's, these are the top ten stories. And it's very hard when you're talking to the business unit to say, well, this is good journalism, this is good business. Well, the numbers are right there. Maybe that's not good business. I'm going to, I'm going to, Scott's, oh, the blogosphere would like to weigh in. Hit it. And their point is, um, with the Edwards case, you're talking about a story that was wrong and then quickly got corrected and there weren't great ramifications to it. What about inaccuracies that happen through speed that really do have ramifications, like getting Steve Jobs' pancreatic cancer or United Airlines' bankruptcy wrong and there are huge stock and financial implications for people and for companies? Okay, as people were talking, I saw people nodding this way, nodding this way, <laughs> doing this. So I'm just going to pass the microphone to some of those folks, starting with the most important person here. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Glenn, uh, what role did the Eau Claire newspaper play in covering this? Did they cover, because I, I was reading accounts actually in the Journal Sentinel about what was happening at your station in the aftermath. Did the, newspa did the newspaper play a role in exposing this, or were they, qu were they silent, or whatever? The newspaper certainly did a good job of finding out about it. Um, they found out about it, I think, the day that I tendered my resignation. Uh, they asked me to talk that day. Uh, 
we as a staff had been told nobody talks about it except the general manager. So I didn't talk to them. I told them, after Friday, I'm not here anymore. If you want to talk about it, then that's fine. So that's when they picked up on it. And, and the initial story, I think, came out probably on the Monday after my last day. Just an observation. Uh, Rick Kite, by the way, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, it seems that we've got a real difference in responses here. The gut, instantaneous decision, and then the one that um, I would say is an example of common sense, where you, you, you establish relationships where you talk about something and develop some kind of sensible decision out of, out of various people's experience. And that gut decisions are generally based on fear and desire, or one or the other or both. But the virtues only come through when we have a chance to deliberate and, and talk and share our experiences. And, and, and I think what, uh, one of the things we can ask about ethical journalism is, is what kinds of practices allow the virtues to come through in, in practice, courage, reverence, honesty. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm Jim Freeman. I've been kind of alarmed, actually, at the tendency to take the papers uh, more toward an entertainment sales model. And the photojournalist question was one that, that, that hits home to me quite a bit, because we often see, you know, now the, the picture on the front page is, is basically the, the top fold very often, you know, in order to get attention and, and sell the paper. But sometimes I wonder if that's a good thing. Uh, I remember years ago when I was here at the university, uh, I witnessed uh, someone get hit by a car stepping off the curb right here on State Street and a person actually did a full flip over the car and died. And one of the students next to me said, wow, I wish I could see that at instant replay. And I worry about the impact of, you know, constant exposure to dramatic events and whether or not at some point it becomes useful in terms of the mission. Uh, Two things, one I wanted to say before, and I was glad to hear you talk about the talking to the staff uh, on what they felt about that picture because my first and immediate thought was I would not run that because I'm a mother and I know how I would feel if I had felt I caused my child's death by not being there. And that, that, that's it. So it helps to have women on the staff, I think. But also um, the concerns about money. Uh, CNN talking about what pays the bills. Well, I read a rather frightening short story about a point in journalism where it was a responsible reporter trying to do good stories online, but the stock price depended on the number of web hits directly. And, and I thought maybe that's where we're going. I we're think we're there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we Somebody here. Well, I just wanted to say a word about leadership uh, and uh, young journalists uh, often uh, often learn by the examples that are around. We don't realize that we're teaching when we take actions. I would suggest that uh, uh, if Glenn hired a lot of his staff up at uh, the, the Eau Claire uh, station, they were good people, but uh, had, had not he had the courage of his leadership abilities, that situation may have turned out differently. And so leadership uh, in the field of ethics is, is very important, too. We've got time for two more comments. I'm going to try to get people who haven't talked. I guess I was trying to think of uh, summing up a couple of the lessons. And one is that speed now does affect the ethics of the decisions. And I don't think we can get away, away from the speed. I think it's even coming on us more and more. Um, the other portion is, in terms of the picture, I probably would have tried to sell it to USA Today or to the Journal Sentinel. Um, and that's somewhat flippant, but the papers that I have worked in for in the past have been community, and there's a, a community papers, and on some of those papers there's a great emotional um, cost to using something of that sort. And so there, people can consider whether the um, audience and the atmosphere we live in, whether there aren't ethical differences in decisions we make. <coughs> I'm going to let one more person go. Phil? 
You know, a question that comes up from time to time when, when you run into an ethical issue is, is what the, respo the responsible response is within the, the, the organization. And Glenn, I'm wondering, you said you were, you didn't want to be uh, insubordinate, so you felt you had to resign. But once you've resigned, you no longer can affect change within the organization. Was there a, another way to, I mean, in, in retrospect, looking back, was there another option? Was there a way to have stayed, made it clear what your stance was, not, and, and, and to your staff, and been able to rally them to your point of view? Maybe you'd have been fired, but if you hadn't been, then you'd still be there to, to, to continue to guide them in that respect. Yeah, just take the easy question, Glenn. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> that one. Or was there one? Um, It, 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 that's something, and that, that first part of your question, is there something else that I could have done? Believe me, it's been, I don't know, 15 months since I've made that, 16 months since I made that decision. Uh, not a week goes by that I don't go back and think about what else could have been done. Part of the issue is there is tremendous pressure on uh, newspapers and, and TV stations uh, alike, I'm sure, to generate revenue. And, and this was an opportunity for this station to generate some pretty good revenue. And as far as the, the making, uh, not being able to affect change, would I have been fired? Probably. Uh, had I refused to do it, would I be able to affect any more change if I'm fired than if I decide to go out on my own terms and say, no, I'm not going to stand up for this? Probably not. Um, it was a tough question, and, and certainly one that I debated for a long time. Um, but it, it just comes back to the rest of the staff knew what was going on. We debated it internally as a staff. Uh, the staff met with the general manager uh, and said, you can't do this. Um, so there was, there was a very unified front in that newsroom. There was, there was not one person in that newsroom who thought this was really a good idea. Uh, but as far as affecting change, did my resignation lead to the article in the Leader Telegram, which led to a spotlight being put on the issue? Perhaps. I'm not going to take credit for that. But, yeah, it's a possibility. Perhaps unintended, but. But wouldn't your firing have done that as well? Yeah, and on the upside, it could have drawn unemployment then. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, um, it's noon, and I'd like to thank all of you, but to ask you to thank all of the panelists for doing this wonderful job for us.